This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. I guess uh, you don't have to have a coupling. You could just set the seal type fitting right next to the EMT connector. All right, we have a service call on a walking cooler that is not working properly. Uh, as customer says, it's about 44 degrees in here, and that is accurate. First thing I see is ice on the suction line. Yep, it's iced up nice and good. And uh, this this is a second coil, so there's two coils in this system. It's like maybe a refrigerant charge issue. All right, this is my condensing unit right here, and uh, I just got to shut it down because uh, we got to defrost the coils before we go any further, but. Condensed fan motors are running, compressors running, so that's a plus. Uh, we'll go ahead and shut it down and then look at the defrost clock and then get downstairs and get it defrosted. All right, the unit does go into defrost, but um, it takes a very long time to pump down. Judging by the look of the back of that evaporator coil, I can tell you that the evap coils are in really bad shape and deteriorating. So that's clock power, 208 volts from one to N. Then we're gonna check from four to N we get zero volts, which is the refrigeration circuit. And then we're gonna check from three to N, and we get 208 volts. So the clock itself is going into defrost, but it was taking a very long time to pump down. I went ahead and put service gauges on it and did a quick pump down test. Again, Copeland doesn't recommend a pump down test, but put service gauges on it, front seat of the suction service valve, and the unit struggled to pull down to zero. It just sat there and ran and ran and ran and it just wouldn't pull down to zero. So I finally just shut it off myself. It looks like we've got a weak suction valve at the minimum, or a weak suction reed, I should say, at a minimum on this thing. But uh, we gotta get it defrosted and go from there. I think technically this is evaporator too, but yeah, it's fully iced up, so. Gotta get it defrosted before we can go any further. I've shown this a ton, but when I defrost these evaporators, I pull the fan motors out completely, so that way I can just go to town. And I still don't get water all over the floor. I just go nice and slow, wait for the drain to fill up, and let it drain. It's not a race. All right, I use my uh, wand. I've shown this a bunch of times. Love this wand. Get it from Lowe's um, in the garden section. But anyways, I use the shower, and then I just regulate it and go nice and slow, get it defrosted. I just do it all from here. Just go a little bit, get the surface, then go a little bit deeper and deeper, and then the stuff will just actually fall off the back. Just gotta be careful not to break bottles and stuff, but a little bit at a time. All right, I had my first bit of uh, ice fall off and I noticed that there was a lot of lint on the ice. So I'm gonna give you guys a shot of what it looks behind here. This coil's completely plugged up, like solid, solid. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep defrosting it, but yeah, that's more than likely the cause of it being iced up. This evaporator is just trash. Look at how the fins are just coming apart. So we're just doing our best to get the surface stuff off so it can breathe. And uh, then we're going to talk to him about replacing this equipment. All right, I got it all back assembled and running. Now we're going to jump on the other evaporator coil, which is over here. And... Uh, I just shut this one off. Now, I've been letting them, they're both on individual breakers, so I've been running this one the entire time with the condensing unit off to get it to defrost, so it's almost defrosted, but we're still gonna pull it apart, give it a cleaning, and uh, make sure there's no more ice. This one's really not even that bad. It's almost defrosted on the inside, but there's a little bit on the outside, but check this out. I guess uh, you don't have to have a coupling could just set the seal type fitting right next to the EMT connector. Some people's kids, right? All right, so this one is not as dirty, and this one is right next to the door. So what that means is, is that someone came and cleaned these coils and only cleaned one of them, because the one by the door should be dirtier. So someone was being lazy is what that meant. But yeah, this coil's trash too, so I'm gonna give it a wrench from the backside. It's all defrosted. Doesn't even look like it's gonna need cleaner really like the other one did. And uh, then uh, we'll 
started up and hopefully everything else works. All right, it is starting to rain on me right now. It's dripping all over me, so we're not gonna be spending a bunch of time on this. I'm gonna make sure that the side glass is clear. Oh boy, are we running low suction pressure right now. Oh, you know what? This thing has a, uh, uh, a Johnson Control A19 temp control, so I wonder if it's calling right now. No, it should be calling. This is an R22. Oh, it's in defrost. I was starting to panic. Hold on, I had uh, put it into defrost a minute ago. I gotta pull this panel. There we go, I popped it out of defrost. We have suction pressure, as you can see, it's pouring rain on me right now. Um, I'm gonna make sure the sight glass is clear and then we're gonna get out of here. Okay, I'm gonna do a pump down test real quick because I did bring my heat producing device. We're gonna check the liquid level. I'm waiting for this guy to actual pump down and satisfy, but one thing I gotta say, man, the field piece gauges, a really cool feature, is the fact that you don't have to worry about them getting wet at all. They are awesome for that reason. But uh, this thing is not very promising right now because it is not pumping down. No bueno. There we go. Took a while, but yeah, this thing's definitely got a weak compressor. It's not sounding very good either, but. All right, receiver level was three quarters or a little bit above three quarters. Um, I am absolutely soaking wet. We've got like a crazy downpour coming through right now. So um, it just like lightened up, but it started pouring a minute ago. But all right, I'm gonna wrap this stuff up, get off the roof. All right, it is slowly coming down to temp in here. Um, let's see, 42 degrees. It's gonna be a little while, but it's getting there. We are back and uh, we're recovering the refrigerant existing from the old unit and we're gonna go ahead and replace this equipment. So recovery machine's running, we're gonna let it go and uh, just start taking everything apart. Two new coils and we got a condensing unit ready to be lifted on the roof. We got a crane coming here soon, so. A little bit at a time, we just got the line set, well, up on the roof, brazed in, um, nitrogen rig set up, getting ready to go downstairs and braze. We got people hanging the coils and doing the drain lines and all that, so we're gonna get brazing downstairs and then trying to beat some rain. Looks like it's getting ready to rain, so we got the easy up just in case. One of the things about these have uh, intelligent evaporator coils. So that's the smart evaporator coils with the electronic valves and all the fancy stuff. Um, with the intelligent, you have the option of making it like a full communicating system, like a beacon, or you can do just a dumbed down condensing unit like this one. This is just a standard condensing unit with no communication between the top and the bottom. With that said, the intelligent evaporator has a built-in defrost clock and it has a built-in time delay. The time delay has to come out the defrost clock is useless. So this is just a standard condensed unit that comes pre-installed with a time delay and a defrost clock. They have to be taken out. And the intelligent evaporator controls everything. All right, it has been a long day. Um, just hooked up the vacuum pump, just got done brazing. I'll show you guys the coils here in a minute. Uh, what I do is I typically start and I'll pull on both sides at first. So I'm pulling on the receiver and I'm pulling on the suction line with the Schrader removed. And then once I see it drop quite a bit, I'll usually close one of them off or something like that. We'll see. Right now I'm running with the gas ballast open. So we're just gonna get it to pull an evacuation. I've pretty much peeled off most of my guys. I sent two of them home already. Still have two here left with me, but I'm gonna be peeling them off too because essentially we're just doing a vacuum and hoping that nothing bad happens. All right, so here's our evaporator for one side. We use an existing line set, so this is already going in um, it was already here, you know, we're just utilizing what we had. We had to run a calm line up there and then here's our other coil. We haven't turned it on yet because we're still evacuating everything. So once we get it evacuated, we'll turn it on and do the programming and hope there's no problems. Okay, so we just powered it up. I'm gonna go into here, enter the expert pin. Configure, yes. It's discovering, so it's supposed to look for the other evaporator, which we've got another one over there. Yeah, it's configuring right now. Two evaporators found, so this is the first startup. Freezer. Cooler 1A. Evaporator 1, or the other evaporator, should be cooler 1B. Select primary evaporator cooler 1A, the one I'm working on. Condensing unit wired no. United States. Time zone. Let's 
Pacific Standard Time. Daylight savings, I don't think it is. I don't know though. It's really not that bad to set these things up. 220. It's weird, it doesn't let you go past. You have to actually. Get March. Today's date is the 18th. And it is 2.44 p.m. Defrost is air defrost, timed. Refrigerant is 448A. Box temp 35. Two units configured start system. Yes. Evaporator fan motor should be starting up. We're good. All right, um, what I did a few minutes ago was I went ahead and front seated the king valve on the receiver and added as much gas as the system would take, which was 11 pounds. And the reason why I did that is so on startup, hopefully it doesn't short cycle. So at this point, the only thing keeping the system off is that king valve. So I'm gonna open it up and we should turn on and hopefully not short cycle. And then I'll add refrigerant as needed. So suction should be rising. Hopefully the compressor is going in the right direction. Yep, I tested the uh, the rotation, phase rotation with my meter before. So that's why I just turned it on blindly. Normally I'd be all ready to shut it down real quick. All right, so now we're gonna continue to charge the unit. Uh, talking with the factory, they want me to put in the max charge in this unit, which is 20 pounds. Uh, anytime Heatcraft just tells you that's the easiest way to do it is just put in the max charge. So you can see I already wrote it all over the unit. So, all right, I'm gonna finish charging this up. It is already 34 degrees in here, down to temp. That's awesome. Um, so I'm actually gonna come do a follow-up probably tomorrow just to verify the defrost and everything's working like it should be. So, but they're good for now, we're good to go. Okay, so we had a service call on a walk-in cooler that wasn't working properly. And when I went out there, it was totally iced up like you guys saw. Uh, the reason why it was iced up, there was a lot of things going on. First off, uh, the coil was plugged solid, at least the one coil was, okay? But then once I got it defrosted and got it cleaned, I showed you guys how deteriorated that coil was too, all right? Um, there was a second coil. The second coil was not as dirty. It was dirty, but that one was deteriorating also. And then the compressor did not sound good, and it had a hard tide pumping down, Um so I went ahead and talked to the customer and the customer chose to go ahead and replace this equipment. This was an old R22 system and they wanted to go ahead and upgrade it. Um, so they sent out some new equipment. We installed it for them, uh, two evaporators and a condenser. We used the existing line set. Um, it was not you know, ideal. I don't like using the existing line sets. A lot of times when I do walk-in replacements for this particular customer, I change the line sets, but this one was gonna be very difficult to do. Um, the, the walk-in itself was exterior to the building and it was just going to be a nightmare to change it. So we decided to go ahead and go with, uh, the existing line set. It's not ideal, but you know, it is what it is. You got to deal with it sometimes. Um, didn't really run into too many problems. This is the first time I've done an IntelliGen with, uh, multiple evaporator coils. So this one had two evaps and we had to run the communication line. Uh, there's a few things they want you to do to be careful about running that communication line. You want you want to use shielded cable. You want to um, uh, you know install the shielded cable correctly. Only land one end of the shield on the ground. The other end you just cut off and you leave open. Um, what else? What else was there with that thing? Uh, I did learn a hard lesson actually the last time I did one of these Intelligen, and that was that you do not power up the evaporator coils while you're doing the evacuation or the uh, nitrogen um, pressure test or anything. You know, if you want to do a nitrogen purge, you leave them powered down because the electronic expansion valves in these actually come uh, open. And then once you power them up, they actually close and then you have to turn the coils on and get them into cooling mode to get them to open. So it's just like a whole thing. So whenever you're doing these installs, I've learned that you, you just hook up the evaporator like it is. You don't um, 
power them up and you can still do a nitro purge and all that good stuff, okay? Uh, very important too with these intelligent coils, anything with the electronic expansion valves. I mean, you really should do it anytime, but it's very important to braze with nitrogen on these things because these electronic expansion valves, I've been hearing a lot of problems that people have been complaining about, the valves not working correctly. Knock on wood, cross my fingers, I have not had any problems with these valves. I attribute it to the fact that I braze with nitrogen every single time and there's nothing getting stuck in them. But hey, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe these valves are faulty, but I have yet to have a problem with any of the electronic valves on the the um, the QRC coils or the intelligence. So cross my fingers. I probably just shot myself in the head with that one, but yeah, it is what it is. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it. I, you know, I really don't get to show a lot of uh, footage when I do installs because I don't show my employees on camera. And obviously we had four guys here, you know, everybody moving around and working and there really wasn't time to show the actual install. So I apologize, but you guys got to see the end result. Um, you know, I think it turned out okay. Of course, you know, I would love to do things better. I'd love to run a new line set. You know, there's, there's all kinds of goofy stuff that I really don't care for with that. Um, but you know, uh, it is what it is, right? You just got to do what you got to do. Sometimes you just got to deal with it. How many times do I got to say, deal with it or do what you got to do but i really appreciate you guys making it to the end uh do me a favor leave me some feedback down in the comments okay i really really would like to see you know what are your guys' thoughts should i have done something differently um do you think that we could uh you know let me know i'm always looking for feedback i'm always curious what you guys have to say uh keep in mind i do live streams monday evenings 5 p.m pacific time uh, where i usually discuss these videos answer questions that kind of stuff i do it on youtube um, so hopefully, uh, you guys can come check that out next week. All right. We will catch you guys on the next one.